Meridian Center for Diplomatic Engagement serves as an educational and networking hub for diplomats to engage with the U.S. government and business community to look for solutions to shared global challenges. You have this reputation and this history going back many years. People trust you. You're a convener. You bring together business. You bring together diplomats, government, the press. The Center for Diplomatic Engagement is also a resource for diplomats to gain a better understanding of the tools and skills that may be helpful to them as they do their jobs. You know, I think Meridian's um, a historic location. It's an organization that has always been um, engaged in the international community and they're a natural, neutral convener and a place to, to have open, honest dialogue. We have to look at, in this interconnected world, these different perspectives. And significantly, each of these sectors have something different to bring to the table. I think it's a wonderful center to bring people together from all over the world who have an understanding of global issues and uh, can share perspectives, try to find common ground. The reason why I'm always coming back is because I'm finding the selection of speakers on a multitude of different uh, issues uh, very refreshing and very informative. And I'm getting to engage with other diplomats uh, from not only the Caribbean, but all over the world. What, what else can you ask for? Good morning and uh, welcome to Meridian's virtual campus. This is Stuart Holliday. I'm the president of Meridian International Center and we'd like to welcome uh, all of our friends uh, in the diplomatic community, the media, the business community. Uh, and we are delighted to have a conversation today that is very timely uh, about the role of uh, mayors and local governments, not only as a function of the pandemic crisis that we're in, but uh, in general, our system of government is is unique, and there are intricacies that I think uh, the outstanding panel we have uh, assembled today uh, can shed some light on. Uh, we will be uh, open press on the record, and uh, we look forward to your questions. If you would use the Q and A function after we have a little bit of a discussion uh, with the mayors, we'll be opening it up for your, your questions. And for those of you that are new to Meridian, uh, we are um, in, in a typical uh, day, a four acre campus over on 16th Street, about a mile up from the White House. Uh, today, we are obviously uh, still closed, but we have been very actively convening uh, virtually and trying to continue to do our work of strengthening uh, cooperation and understanding between the United States and other countries. And so uh, thanks to all of you who support the Center for Diplomatic Engagement. Um, it's my pleasure to now introduce our uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, Mayor Larian Gale Baird of uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, the capital of Nebraska, city of about 300,000 uh, people. Um, we have David Holt, uh, who is the mayor of Oklahoma City, also uh, the, uh, the state capital uh, with about 650,000 uh, people. Um, and we have Paul Kenitra, who's the, the mayor of uh, Point Pleasant Beach in New Jersey, which is uh, a city that, uh, a town that, that normally has uh, around 5,000 uh, people and then swells to over 60,000 during the summer. And obviously tourism, travel uh, is, is deeply affected by the current pandemic, but uh, welcome mayors. Um, we're delighted that you could join us today. Um, I, I wanted to start with a question for, uh, for all of you, um, which is effectively, what, what is the current status of your city's reopening plans? And uh, how, how did you uh, either work with your governors or come up independently with a plan that worked for your particular case? And obviously our, uh, our thoughts go out to 
uh, not only everybody affected by the COVID pandemic, but more recently by the tragic uh, issues around race and injustice that we've seen, obviously sitting here in Washington, uh, everybody feels, uh, you know, like there, there's uh, an uncomfortable sense um, uh, that uh, we as a country, you know, aren't doing enough uh, to, to deal with some of these issues. And, and so uh, bringing, bringing those issues into the discussion a little bit later would be interesting, but I'll start with the COVID issue and Mayor Baird, maybe to you first. Sure. Well, good morning to everyone and thank you for this opportunity to be with you, uh, Ambassador, and so many diplomats and leaders from around the globe and my fellow mayors. So in Lincoln, Nebraska, we are fortunate to live in the middle of everything. That's what we like to call Lincoln, Nebraska, the middle of everywhere. And we had an advantage when the pandemic first began to become apparent in that the experience of coastal communities gave us a preview of what might be headed our way. And in terms of our community response, much of it was led by our community voluntarily. Many businesses closed their doors and sent their employees home uh, without any sort of directive to do so. Uh, the universities sent students home. The public schools did not bring students back after spring break. Kids were kids were out of school on spring break when it became clear that the decision point uh, was before them. And then we were able to work with our health department and community systems, health systems leaders, our cultural community leaders uh, to try to get the message out about what was coming and how to take steps to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We did impose some directed health measures that closed some personal care businesses and reduced the activities of restaurants but we didn't ever have a shelter in place order in effect here. Um, and our governor and the state uh, leadership also provided a lot of communication and direction about how to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And because of that strong and early action, which we were fortunate to be able to take given the experiences, the advanced experiences of coastal cities, um, we didn't see our healthcare system overwhelmed. Um, our numbers of cases and infections have been relatively small. Um, and what we've since worked to do is to, um, to allow some of those effect businesses affected by our directed health measures to slowly uh, experience the opportunity to resume operations in a limited capacity. And we're working to support them to do that safely. I'll just say one more thing and that we've developed as a tool, a, a risk dial, a sort of forecast of risk for our community so that anyone in our community, whether they're a resident or a business, or an educator, leader in the educational system can look to the level of risk for spread based on current conditions and public guidance that we're providing. And we hope to be able to manage for the long haul with that sort of kind of information and guidance coming from our local health officials. Great, uh, Mayor Holt, how about Oklahoma City? Yeah, we uh, had our first case of local spread on March 15th. And so if you remember kind of the chrono chronology of this, that was significantly later than many coastal cities. And so we had the opportunity to observe what had happened in other places. So we moved pretty fast. We declared a state of emergency literally on that day of the first case. And within two days, we were closing restaurant dining rooms and gyms and theaters. A week later, our governor um, closed non-essential businesses and then we, we declared it shelter in place soon after that. So then we stayed in that status for about five or six weeks. Um, and May 1st was when the governor decided to um, lift the restrictions at the state level. And we kind of had a tough decision on what to do. We had you know, the power at the local level to keep restrictions and closures in place in our city but you know, as mayor of Oklahoma City, I am only mayor of maybe half the people who live in metropolitan Oklahoma City. So my city is 650,000, but 1.4 million people live in the immediate vicinity. And so we really felt like we had to follow the state, even though we didn't have to, the public health benefit of trying to carve out our own corner of the universe was, was nil. So, so we moved forward, but we did put some restrictions, things like, you know, Servers in the restaurants had to wear masks, tables had to be six feet apart, that sort of thing. Uh, we did that for two weeks. May 15th was phase two for us. That's when bars reopened. Um, and then June 1st was phase three, where at this point, really we have no 
enforceable restrictions left. We are kind of at the point of just encouraging people to, to do their best and follow CDC guidelines. And uh, at the end of phase three, middle of this month, um, you know, we may emerge out of these proclamations and out of a state of emergency. And obviously the hard challenge for people uh, like the mayors on this call is, is com continuing to communicate that even though uh, we have done so, we still have a deadly virus in our community, we'll have it for a very long time. And how do we move forward doing these activities that carry risk uh, without seeing an, a spike in cases and having to contemplate going back to some of the, the structures we had in place in March and April. And uh, Mayor Kenichi, you're obviously a beach town. You, you have the double-edged sword of needing to reopen for your economic uh, purposes, but also uh, attracting a large number of people uh, would be a challenge. But how, how are you, uh, where are you in this uh, process and what do you see ahead? Ambassador, thanks for having me. And uh, it has been a challenge. And, and that's been every single day since uh, the middle of March when we had our first case here in, uh, in Point Pleasant Beach. And you know we've tried to do a good job of representing our constituency. Not only do we swell exponentially in the summer months, uh, but our year round population is roughly 50% senior citizens. So they're uh, you know, the most vulnerable population here uh, we were the first town in New Jersey to shut down our boardwalk. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were working proactively so that we kept our, our numbers low from the very get-go. Uh, just within 10 miles of here, we have multiple communities with over a thousand different cases uh, here in, uh, in Ocean County and, uh, and throughout the state of New Jersey. There's some real hot spot areas. Now, we've been able to keep our numbers low in Point Pleasant Beach, even proportionally low to our population size. Uh, and that's taken some very hard decisions here as we gear up for our vital summer season. Uh, obviously, we shut down the beach. We shut down the boardwalk. We had to put uh, parking restrictions in place, too, because people were still coming into town uh, and flooding in. Obviously, when people are cooped up for so long, they're looking for uh, some sort of respite, some, some opportunity to go out and recreate a little bit. And uh, we just weren't in a place originally where we could handle that capacity. Now, over the last couple of weeks, over the last month or so, we started to, to ease those restrictions. New Jersey, uh, as many people know, was the second hardest hit state. And the only reason it wasn't the first hardest is because of our size. I mean, we're the most population dense state uh, in the United States. Per square mile, nowhere else was affected as, as hard as, uh, as we were. And, uh, and that's been part of the, the struggle here because our, our economy really is driven by July and August. And we wanted to make sure that we were making the proper decision so that we didn't have a second wave, so that numbers still weren't flaring up in, in those vital months. And uh, we've eased back uh, most of our restrictions. We just reopened uh, our beaches right before Memorial Day weekend. We reopened our boardwalk shortly thereafter. And then uh, as of this Friday, we'll roll back our parking restrictions and uh, will essentially be as open for business as, as allowed by our governor, who still is taking a lot of, uh, of different measures, you know, rides, amusements, games, things that people think of with a seashore community are all still shut down. Uh, so we've still got some more steps ahead here and we're working in tandem with the governor, which I think is important. And one more thing that I wanted to add in that we've been involved, uh, you know, from the very start, I, I think in helping them uh, figure out their guidance for the state and for similar communities. Everybody thinks when you're younger that, you know, the, the state and you know, the state's got this plan for everything. And, you know, it comes out that nobody was necessarily pre prepared for a global pandemic. So they convened a panel of about seven uh, mayors from across the state. And we told them what our challenges were, things like seasonal officers, where we have 24 year round officers, and then we go up to about 100 in the summertime. And resources are an important component we'll talk about later uh, in terms of managing a situation like ours. And they took a lot of what they learned from us, and they've been implementing it accordingly. So, uh, well, Mayor Baird and Mayor Holt, you may not have beaches, but you do have universities. And I know, Mayor Baird, you're, you're on a commission, I think, uh, that is uh, of mayors uh, looking at uh, higher ed and universities. What, what do you see in terms of the schools opening up? Uh, has there been any guidance? Uh, and, and obviously these are important uh, both through athletics and, uh, and obviously as economic drivers. 
Um, and I, I know have, I have a college age son who's very anxious to get back to college, but how are you all, uh, how do you see it from the, from the standpoint of the, the schools? Yes, we're, we're home to the flagship University of Nebraska Lincoln here. And we're also fortunate to have the University of Nebraska Med Center and the Biocontainment Unit for Infectious Disease. We have got incredible experts in infectious disease right here in our backyard who've helped to guide the educational uh, system response. Um, I have a high school graduate, uh, someone who didn't really get to graduate in the normal way this year, who's excited to go off to college as well. And so many parents and all of us want to know what that, what that fall semester might look like. And I think they're trying to be really creative about how to keep kids safe, how to oper have opportunities for quality learning uh, with some physical distancing, with strategies around starting the school year earlier and ending the semester earlier to try and avoid sort of the double whammy of uh, the winter weather and influenza, the rise of influenza along with the potential for further spread of COVID-19. So there is a, a lot that's, of care that's being taken to try to protect the safety of our young people and their faculty. And then of course there is the economic impact to a college town like ours. We our success and our vitality and our vibrancy of our local economy are absolutely linked uh, to the, uh, the university, to the sporting events, to our football team, our volleyball, our national champion volleyball team. So we know that we're, we're in this together and um, but we are gonna put the safety of, of students and faculty in our community first as, as we work to try to develop innovative ways to adapt and evolve the way we do education here in Nebraska. Great, uh, David, same question. Uh, universities, is it the same uh, sort of thinking about maybe starting earlier, uh, implementing some social distancing or are you all? Uh... We have a couple of large public universities in our suburbs, the University of Oklahoma and University of Central Oklahoma, um, but they are not in our city. So we haven't had a lot of direct right about their procedures. Um, I just know from the news media that they have indicated uh, 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 their likelihood of returning to in-person education in the fall. I'm probably more thinking right now and, and worried more about K through 12, you know, I mean, uh, and that's that certainly is a salient issue here in Oklahoma City and what's going to happen yeah. there. And our government, that's outside of my jurisdiction, public education, but um, it's certainly something that I'm keenly interested in how that's going to develop in the fall. And there, no decisions have been made in that regard. So. Great. And I was hoping maybe a question for you all, uh, for, the, for the diplomats, about the uh, authority you have as a mayor, sort of how that relates to your state government, uh, and, and, and even, obviously, how you all might interface with elements of the federal government. Uh, mayor Baird? Yeah, that's, that's been a question that's come up uh, over the course of this is, is really key decisions about what restrictions to put in place or what kind of easing of those restrictions can be accomplished. And, and we really know that in a public health emergency, the coordination at every level of government is so important. At the same time, uh, so much of the development of strategies has been left to states and cities because the federal you know coordination has been uh, kind of a hands-off approach, I guess you could say. And so we have been regularly in regular communication with the governor and their, their team at the state, um, lots of communication and advocacy with our federal delegation for uh, resources for communities to fuel that local response. And we also recognize that as we try to implement measures to help guide public choices about how to stay safe, how to continue to navigate life in a pandemic that has no foreseeable end until there's a vaccine, um, that it's really productive to have a unified response so that people are getting clear messages about what those steps are. Um, we're really grateful for the kind of support we've received from the state and the federal government. At the same time, much of the relief efforts has been targeted uh, and rightfully so at, at supporting local businesses and our health response at the very moment that cities that are coordinating a health response are getting devastated economically. Our budgets are taking incredible hits from the, um, the economic impact of the virus. And so 
we are looking and advocating for relief from the federal government for cities so that we don't have to cut important frontline services, whether they're police, fire, medical response, or our public health teams that are so key to keeping everyone safe. Paul? Well, New Jersey is a home rule state. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the concept that uh, every town, city, borough has the right to govern itself through its own police and fire departments, water systems, planning boards, school systems, things like that. Uh, and, uh, and that results in, in a lot of different uh, personalities here. I mean, to put in perspective, I think Florida has uh, about 400 municipalities. New Jersey has 565 municipalities. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of big personalities and, and individual ways of thinking. And, and we've seen here that a one size fits all solution uh, doesn't necessarily work because even when you're looking at beach towns uh, like ours, the size and width of our boardwalk is very different than our counterparts down the coast. The number of officers that we have as resources is, is different. So coordination has been key, uh, not necessarily in terms that we're all moving lockstep together, but that we're sharing information and that we're learning from each other. And that's extended from the federal level all the way down to the local level. I mean, uh, the White House has a weekly call uh, for mayors across the country. I'm sure the other mayors uh, jump on that as well. And, uh, you know, that's a very high top level perspective where we all get to learn what they're doing and what resources are coming down the line. On the state, we have a weekly call with the mayors from a tri-county area. Our county itself has a weekly call. And then even on our barrier island here, uh, our 10 different mayors, we have a weekly call where we're discussing everything too. And, uh, and that's been invaluable through the, the course of the pandemic. Right. David? Yeah, I, I bet it is pretty interesting if you come from another country where local and provincial state and national governments can be very vertically integrated. You know, here it is so different and, and it creates a lot of opportunity for independence. We call that, you know, in America, we often refer to that as the, the laboratories for democracy exist at the city and state level. And we get to try different things and see if they work and others might adopt those practices, but it's messy as well, you know, and, and especially in times of crisis. So um, you look at Oklahoma City, for instance, we have Oklahoma City, and then I have like 20 other cities in my immediate vicinity, what we call our suburban communities. Um, they all have their own governments and their own mayors and their own councils and their own police departments. Then you've got a county government layered on top of it. Uh, and then you've got a city county health department, which normally sort of operates in the background and people don't think a lot about it. And it's out there, you know, making sure people get vaccinated and, and, and following up on, you know, other pandemics that haven't been as high, high profile. But at a time like this, suddenly it's the most important agency we have in central Oklahoma. And it is sort of created as a hybrid between the county and city governments. And then on top of that, obviously, you have your state government and it's got a state health department. And all of us are trying to coordinate, but we are not compelled to by law, you know? And so it is really important that we just use our, our diplomacy skills and our, our leadership abilities to communicate and, and try to uh, match our actions as best we can, especially in a pandemic, it is kind of important that we don't send a lot of mixed signals and, uh, and that we're on, our, on the same page as much as possible. But it also, you know, sometimes we have different constituencies. The state's view of the pandemic may be different than the people of Oklahoma City's view of the pandemic. And the people of Yukon, a suburb of Oklahoma City, may feel that it's not as big of an issue to them as it is to the people in my city, even though we're just a few miles apart. So um, all of that has been, a, has been a major part of the challenge in this. Early on, I brought together all of our mayors and we started trying to at least communicate. We can't necessarily uh, compel each other to do the same thing, but at least let's be aware of what others are doing. And obviously we've tried to stay in touch with the governor and we have largely been on the same page, but that's, you know, that's not always the case and that's, that's natural. Um, I would also add in Oklahoma, there's two large cities and the other one is about 90 minutes away and that's Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we tried, I'm very close with the mayor of Tulsa and we tried to also coordinate very closely uh, and kind, especially in the early days and kind of send a signal that way that our two cities were moving uh, at the same pace and doing basically the same things. We felt that if the two major cities in the state um, were not on the same uh, path that that would be confusing and send a mixed signal to the people. So we literally announced when our cities were going shelter in place at the same hour um, for that reason to send a, 
a strong signal of unity and that this was the right course of action. Yeah, so it's interesting. There's there's no structure or playbook for this, but you have to use your relationships and uh, your powers of persuasion to get what you need from a variety of different stakeholders. It's, it sounds like a very challenging job on top of having local constituents want wanting to fix potholes and <laughs> build schools and all that. So it's, it's a tough job. Um, I wanted to shift, uh, well, first of all, I want to remind people that they can ask uh, questions using the Q&A button uh, here. But I wanted to shift to the, the events of the, the last week. And while your cities are not necessarily DC, New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, um, these, uh, these issues of uh, uh, racial division and reconciliation, anger, frustration, uh, both legitimate peaceful protests, and then obviously we've seen a lot of damage and uh, vandalism here, here in Washington by, by people who aren't uh, probably uh, concerned with the, with, with the principal uh, tragedy at hand. But um, what do you all see as your role in creating community dialogue or helping your police force uh, and your, you, you know, your minority community leaders uh, work out some of these issues so that people feel um, that there's, uh, you know, that, that they're going to be treated fairly, uh, but that also that they have an avenue to express um, their concerns. Uh, I guess I'll start, uh, Mayor Baird, with, with, with you. This is an incredibly painful time in our communities across the country. It's amazing that we've been, we've been going through an experience of a pandemic that has unified us in a threat of a virus. And we have been experiencing, having a shared experience now of the pain and anguish of what has infected our country from its very beginning, which is like the disease of racism. Uh, America's shameful 400 year history of some of our community members, our African-American community members, having a different experience of America than white Americans. An experience where they don't necessarily feel treated like full human beings, the dehumanization of black people in America that we witnessed on video in Minneapolis has led to this moment of outcry because it's not a single moment. It's the last in centuries of mistreatment. And as mayors, we need to be listening. We need to be honoring the leadership of so many young people who are peacefully calling for change and for an end to racial injustice and structural inequalities in our community. So some deep listening and trying to work with everyone in our community to develop those solutions together. And mayors have a convening power. That is one of the, the real powers of a mayor, whether you're a weak uh, form of government, a weak mayor form of government, a strong mayor form of government. There, there are variations on that across the country, uh, the thing that mayors have the power to do is to bring people together and try to work out solutions, solutions that will affect you know, conversation and communication is a solution. That's a starting point, but also looking at ways to address the systemic inequalities, whether that's in our police institutions of law enforcement, whether that's in our healthcare systems that we have seen the disproportionate impact that the pandemic is having on communities of color, whether that is in our educational institutions, and just daily life. There's just a lot that all of us have to do to address concerns and make real change. And mayors are in a unique position to convene people, to begin that dialogue towards a future that is more humane, more fair, more just, more peaceful. Right. Uh, David. Yeah, um, uh, it'd be, it would be hard to top what uh, Mayor Baird just said, but um, in Oklahoma City, you know, we have a, a complicated relationship with 
with race. And, and it's, I find that it's convenient and easy for our white community to pat ourselves on the back and say, isn't it great that we got rid of Jim Crow laws? And isn't it great that when overt acts of racism are committed that we shout it down in the public square? But that tends to release us from our obligation to look at the very real disparity and outcomes um, that you have between people of different races in our city. You know, if, if you're born in the more traditionally homogeneously white part of Oklahoma City, or I should say if you're raised in that part of the city, you are you know, uh, statistically more likely by an order of magnitude to have uh, you know, a longer lifespan, better economic success, higher educational attainment than you know, someone who grows up in what is still basically almost segregated you know, historically African-American parts of our city. And I think it is high past time. I've tried as mayor, one of my top four issues moving into office was, as I usually refer to it, incorporating the diversity of our city into our decision-making because clearly that, that issue right there, you know, all of our decisions were being made generally by white people from Northwest Oklahoma City, usually men. That was, you know, and I, I, I saw that that table needed to, to be enlarged. Um, and so, I've talked about it, but it's high past time, obviously, to elevate the issue even higher and, and the protests across the nation and in here in Oklahoma City are certainly doing that. Um, there's many, many aspects to it. And, and it's an issue we got into, a challenge we got into over the course of decades. So we're not going to get out of it in one week. But, um, you know, law enforcement is one part of it. And we've had those discussions this week about revisiting some of our policies. Um, and we'll move forward with that soon. And, you know, but there's, there's also issues, as I just referred to, of just, you know, representation in our decision making. There's issues of, you know, making sure that investments are equitable across our community, um, all of those things. But also at the individual level, I think a mayor can serve as an example. Um, as as uh, Mayor Baird said, regardless of your form of government, in our form of government, I'm just one vote out of nine and the commitments I make um, only speak for myself, not necessarily my city until the council has adopted it. But I am the face of the city and I can listen and I have done so intently this week. And I can also urge people like me, uh, white people from Oklahoma City who've had, you know, a lot of advantages that we may not have even realized that we had, uh, urge them to, to understand that and, and, and appreciate it and accept it and start thinking about how we start giving everybody uh, the same opportunity. Um, it's never been in America about equal results, but um, it's a myth that is still perpetuated that everybody has equal opportunity in this country. They just don't. And, uh, and that's what's probably been uh, the biggest wake up call for a lot of people this week is really starting to grasp that and understand that. And if we can all do that, I think a lot of the change will come from that. So, uh, Mayor Holt, just to follow up, not to put you on the spot, but we, we do have a question about uh, the sort of statistics in terms of the Oklahoma, you know, police department. I think police departments uh, around the country are, are, are all accountable. Um, but in, in this case, do you, do you have a plan or are you working on uh, some kind of initiative to, to uh, address what seems to be a pretty high, you know, statistical uh, level of, of, of instances in, you know, your jur jurisdiction. Right. So in our form of government, um, the mayor and none of the elected officials have any uh, operational authority over the police department uh, that we have a city manager and we hire him and then he hires the police chief. And we're not we're barred from government from telling the police what to do in like a day to day sense. However, we very much have a role in setting policies, broad policies and accountability and put accountability measures in place, um, you know, that will effectuate better outcomes on a day to day basis. And so this week uh, I committed to, 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 to use the power I have, you know, again, I can't unilaterally act. I, I have to get the support of the rest of the council, but to use that power to revisit our de-escalation policy, make sure that it reflects best practices. Uh, and then also we had a, we have a little known but longstanding citizens advisory board uh, in our city that, uh, that it engages with the police department, but honestly has a very low profile, does not operate in public. Um, and that clearly needs to change. And so that's the second thing that I've committed to is working on some sort of accountability mechanism 
that has more tie back to the to the public, has a higher profile, has just got more credibility with the public, and and there's a lot of models out there, and we'll we'll explore those in the days ahead. Um, but those are two things, two concrete actions that I've already committed to this week here in Oklahoma City, and we'll continue to have these discussions. Great, Paul. Well, Point Pleasant Beach is in a very unique situation, even though everybody thinks about New Jersey as, uh, you know, kind of this highly populated state, this dense state. Uh, our community is, is pretty isolated in a lot of ways in the, in the off season. And, uh, you know, our sense of community here is incredible. You know, it's our, our town traditions, our bonfire, our tree lighting ceremony, uh, our seafood festival, things like that that make us great. In the, in the season, though, uh, we become a real true melting pot for the entire tri-state area. And that goes back to the, the growth that we see there. So, uh, you know, our police force, our administration, uh, the town in general, obviously, uh, has, a, has a drastic shift there. And I think our police force has done an incredible job in the past of making sure that we uh, create a welcoming environment for, uh, you know, the, the masses that come in. And, uh, and that's something that you can always do a better job on. So we've been talking about that on our daily calls here every, every morning about, you know, how we make uh, Point Pleasant Beach even more of a welcoming uh, community because uh, obviously, uh, you know, I, I can't say it as, uh, as eloquently as, as the other mayors did, but uh, you know, what happened in, in Minneapolis was, uh, was just heinous. And it, it made, uh, you know, small town America, uh, just as sick watching it as, uh, as it did uh, the big cities like uh, that are represented on this call here. And whether you're a small municipality or a huge city, uh, you know, you have a charge to serve and you have uh, a, a responsibility on your shoulders to be part of, part of the change. In my professional career, you know, I, from a very early age, I've tried to work with government. I, you know, I, I have a, a government relations firm and the focus has always been trying to give the masses a voice, trying to give people who couldn't afford a voice a voice, uh, trying to, you know, peel back all the nepotism and uh, campaign contributions and all that sort of thing. And, and I'm trying to make that applicable here in, in Point Pleasant Beach as well. And we're trying to make sure that, uh, that again, everybody feels welcome and whatever changes we need to put in place to do so that we're, we're working on that. Great. Um, I'd like to uh, shift to economics for a second. Uh, and there's, there's three questions from the, the audience. I'm going to try to tie them together uh, so that you can cover them. Um, I guess the, the first is, uh, do you see your economies, you know, rebounding uh, as a result of just getting back to, you know, business after the pandemic, or is there structural systemic, you know, ongoing uh, concern and damage? And related to that, there is a question about, from a congressional candidate, David Applefield in New Jersey, uh, about are you getting uh, enough support from Congress financially, not, not only for, for this issue, but if you could get some resources to deal with these, uh, the, the social and racial issues, the inequities, those kinds of issues, would, would additional resources, are you getting those resources? And if you're not, could you use uh, funds, additional funds to, to, to do that? Uh, I'm somewhat mangling the questions, but really I, it's the general question is, is relating to economic rebound, uh, permanent um, effects, and, and then you know, resources from the federal level on both uh, uh, the inequ inequity issue and, and obviously uh, more broadly. So Mayor Baird. Thank you for the question. We of course are very focused on this. All mayors across the country are trying to think through how do you start to rebuild prosperity and opportunity with, and, and here in Lincoln, we have formed a, an economic recovery task force that includes a focus on not only resiliency as a community, but inclusivity. Do believe we have an opportunity to emerge from the challenges we face even stronger if we are intentional about the kind of community we rebuild and economy that we foster. We don't want to go back to what was before. We want to figure out how to address systemic issues, whether they're related to inequality, uh, related to race or economic opportunity more generally. I think we're going to be looking at um, strengthening our local businesses' ability to uh, adapt to future crises by 
helping them transition more services online. And we're fortunate to be one of 30 smart gigabit cities in the United States. We have strong tech infrastructure here that can help support those kinds of efforts. Um, we're, we're gonna be trying to cultivate more local supply chains and be more resilient economically in terms of what we make here locally. And we're also gonna be looking at how we help workers who may be in industries that are permanently affected reskill or upskill. So partnership, I, I fully anticipate there'll be a lot of work in, done in partnership with our community colleges and our universities to try to help people create and forge new paths for themselves as employees. Um, and, you know, and then looking at different sectors of the economy, you know, how can we use the, the, the strong startup ecosystem to help us innovate and adapt and create new opportunities? Um, how can we really keep an eye on making sure that going forward, people aren't getting left behind, that there are more opportunities for jobs. Um, and the resources on the federal level, absolutely. <laughs> We've been advocating for them as a community of mayors. The US Conference of Mayors has uh, repeatedly lobbied the federal government. And I think we've all reached out to our, our federal delegations because um, we are in Lincoln, 50% of our budget is based on sales tax receipts. And of course, people aren't eating out as much. We don't have any concerts going on. People aren't going to football games and spending money in restaurants and shops. So we're losing and bleeding revenue at the same time that we're trying to put in place the kind of infrastructure that will help us rebuild. And so a lot of what will happen for us as cities will depend on how long before there's a vaccine, how long we're in a situation where people feel reluctant to leave home, reluctant to spend time out in public, um, but that won't stop us from working hard to uh, focus on how we support the arts community, how we support our educational systems, uh, how, how we support employees in getting the skills they need to try to find a new path forward. And that's, a, you know, that's, that's where we will be focused for the foreseeable future. Great, Mayor Holt. Yeah, we expect a, you know, pretty long tail to the economic fallout of COVID-19 um, for a lot of the reasons that Mayor Baird mentioned. Um, without a vaccine or a proven treatment, there will still be uh, a reasonable level of fear about going out and, and doing certain things. Um, and that will have an impact on our budget because uh, much like Lincoln, we are predominantly dependent on sales tax. Um, and in fact, that is our only tax revenue stream in Oklahoma City. So. Um, we're concerned. I, having said that, to be optimistic, you know, we um, probably are through the worst of it. Uh, one would think that shelter in place is, is you know, the, uh, the most impactful thing that could have occurred uh, to lessen our sales tax and that now we can see, we will see more revenue moving forward. But I don't think we bounce out of this, you know, by July or something. I think it will be many months uh, of, of impact. And I think what we can do at the government level to try and mitigate that is to create a robust infrastructure for uh, testing and tracing so people feel like um, those who have uh, caught the virus are being found and are, and are getting uh, you know, quarantined and treated. And, and so um, we will continue to pursue building that. As a city over 500,000, we were given CARES Act dollars directly uh, for our COVID-19 response. Um, the other cities here, unfortunately, no offense, have to go through their states, and so it's one more step, but hopefully they will get that support, and, uh, but, but we are able to kind of, uh, right now, vision how uh, we will use that money and work with our city county health department to build that infrastructure. It's getting better here in terms of our data for, pan for the pandemic. Um, it's still, you know, new cases every day, but nothing like it was. It's clearly declining. Um, so we are managing that at the same time. I really think a lot about the fall. I mean, I feel like we'd be fools not to be preparing for a second wave that was similar to the one in the spring. And so I hope that we can get that infrastructure in place so that uh, we don't have to repeat uh, economically the kind of um, impact that we had in, in March and April. And to your point about federal funding, um, there's federal funding for the COVID-19 response that I just referenced. There's also the hope for federal support for our lost revenues. The CARES Act dollars were explicitly, uh, it was explicitly stated they could not support um, our, our revenue shortfall. And that has really been the biggest financial need that we had. 
And of course we can't borrow money, but the federal government can. So that's why we turn to them uh, in times like this. And they, um, they have not yet given us that, those dollars or the authority to use the dollars we already have for that purpose. Although we're, we're still exploring some potential um, loopholes there that we might be able to apply some of those dollars to our public safety needs. And that would go a long way because that's a big part of our budget. So we're still working through that. But right now we have no federal support for the financial impact of COVID-19. So uh, Mayor Kenitra, I guess you got to get the beach open and the restaurants open. That's your, you know, you don't necessarily have manufacturing and those kinds of things do you? I mean, it's mainly on the, as a, you know, uh, leisure and tourism destination, right? Well, for a small town, there's actually a lot of different levels at play here in, in Point Pleasant Beach. The municipality itself on a $15 million budget, uh, you know, about 3 million of that is derived from parking revenue, from hotel and motel taxes, court revenue, things along those lines. So uh, that is a big concern for us. But again, we feel just from what we've seen in terms of beach badge sales, uh, in terms of people coming out on nice days already, that July and August are really going to help us out quite a bit on, on that front. And we've built up quite a nice surplus here in a rainy day fund that we'll be able to go to to offset uh, a lot of that. But uh, yeah, I see firsthand here, because I know all my business owners individually in, in Point Pleasant Beach, which is uh, uh, a unique aspect, and, you know, this is going to be a very big challenge for all of them. Most of them didn't have more than a couple weeks operating revenue. Um, some of the ones that were set up for takeout and takeout food and things like that were, uh, were able to, to weather this storm and have been able to keep things operational. But there's been uh, a lot of inequity on this front, too. In New Jersey, you can go to Target and you can buy T-shirt, shorts, baseball, glove, mitt, whatever you need. But you can't go into our local surf shop or our local sporting goods shop and buy those same things. So it's devastated our downtown. And, you know, the focus of this administration when we came in in January was always going to be about business and economic development. And, uh, and that has uh, never taken on more of an important role than, than it has right now because we need, to, we need to take a shift that we were going to work on, uh, you know, over the, the coming years to make our town less of a seasonal town, uh, more of a year round destination and leverage on our historic downtown and the beautiful buildings downtown and the great restaurants downtown and find a path forward so that people from across the tri-state area are thinking of us outside of three or four or five summer months. And one of the ways that we've done that, and I think this is an important component to look at is, you know, how things are going to shift afterwards because everybody's uh, most people's, you know, revenues are down. Most people's savings are down. Um, you know, so the ability for a lot of people, and you mentioned uh, minorities, underserved communities, things along those lines, the ability for somebody to start a business after this is going to be drastically reduced. So we've brought in uh, a staffer. It's, it's pretty lucky for us as a small town. We brought in a policy expert from the state legislature. Most sp uh, small towns don't have this. And we're in the process of conceptualizing a pop-up program that we think is going to be really uniquely situated as we climb out of this because building owners are going to have a hard time attracting tenants because people won't have the money to pay for rents. And people that need to start up businesses, whether you're making homemade soap at home or uh, you know, selling things on eBay or whatever it may need and, and, a, and a storefront would be helpful, you're not necessarily going to have the money for infrastructure build out uh, and to be able to go pay those rents. So we're conceptualizing a pop-up program that's gonna take care of some of the vacancies that we already have downtown and some of the vacancies that we anticipate coming where we'll be able to match people with building owners and we'll be able to find a mutually beneficial solution where you can come in, you're not really doing any infrastructure changes, but you're able to have a storefront. They're still able to show the property. It's a short-term lease, so it can be terminated at any time. And we're hopeful that we can do it on a percentage of profits so that again, you're, you're able to create kind of some economic driving here uh, on the local community. And we're looking at creative solutions. Like Interesting, I think there's a lot of thinking about innovation and uh, how things can you know, get done uh, differently. Uh, Pop-ups are interesting. We've got uh, just five minutes uh, or so left. And I wanted to also kind of uh, wind up with a question for, uh, uh, for Mayor Baird and uh, Mayor Holt. That's a two-part question. Um, I'm combining two questions here from the audience. Uh, one is, 
because you're not on the coasts and you know sort of you're in the heartland um, the first part of the question is were people more skeptical about this virus and what it was uh, represented in terms of a threat uh, because obviously you know Seattle and uh, New York and others and the second question from Hong Sha Lu one of our uh, former trustees is do your constituents have any view of uh, and I don't mean that this to sound, uh, you know, uh, patronizing in any way, but do they, do they care about foreign policy and do they have a, an, an, a thought now as a result of this pandemic coming from China, uh, do they, do they have a view of China as, uh, you know, obviously a lot of your businesses probably do business with China. There's a lot of trade with China, but then there's, there's also the, perception of China perhaps as a as a competitor rival or even opponent in certain cases so those are two uh, different questions but I was wondering if you could touch on those mayor Baird uh, first sure. well thank you for the questions uh, I think that initially across the country whether you lived in the heartland or on the coast in the very earliest moments there was a lot of um, you know a very primitive understanding of what this virus might mean and the thought that it would it, it might just be like the flu. And then that quickly changed as we saw in New York and Seattle and other communities start to be deluged with cases of infection and individuals who are suffering in hospital systems that were being slammed. Um, so here in the heartland, I, I don't believe there was a really uh, overwhelming sense of it, it, of being skepticism about the power of the virus. But there is of course, I think a debate in one of those there's the ethical debate that people have about what are you willing to give up to, you know, to try to pr provide the prevention and the protection from this disease. And people have different, people are come at that from different perspectives. Um, you know, for the governor of Nebraska, the metric that he's using for reopening is simply uh, the number of hospital beds and ventilators that are available. So he's sort of, you know, um, working with that metric as his indicator of how well we're doing. You'll talk to public health officials across our state and, and locally here in Lincoln Lancaster County, and we've wanted to also think through how do we uh, do the best prevention of this disease? How do, we, how do we make sure that we are addressing those who are disproportionately impacted? What can we do as a community, not only to protect our health healthcare system, but protect those who are most vulnerable to this disease? Um, so I think we've had real inspiring community response as a whole. People have been willing to sacrifice so much in Lincoln to try to protect the most vulnerable. Um, but that kind of sacrifice can't be sustained over years and years. And that's why trying to find the right amount of um, movement towards um, an easing of restrictions that allows for both the protection of people and the uh, economic recovery and rebuilding. And the messaging that we've done here in Lincoln has been those two things are intertwined. It is not like the idea that you that public health is one choice and the economic recovery is another choice is a false, it's a false premise that they are inextricably, inextricably linked. So that's something we focused on locally as a message. In terms of foreign policy, you know, um, we are, I think, you know, Lincoln's population might surprise you while we are sort of a population of almost 300,000 people, 80% of whom identify as white. Uh, we have uh, an incredibly diverse population of refugees who have resettled in Lincoln for decades. In 2016, um, Nebraska led the nation in terms of re refugees resettled per capita. So the influences of other countries are here and strong and important. Over you know, 50 different languages are, are spoken in our public, by, by children who attend our public schools. And we have one of the largest Yazidi refugee communities in the world. So uh, we're really proud of the international diversity of our community. Um, and one of the other things that I think this pandemic has taught all of us is how interconnected we all are across the globe. And you know, we're, we're interconnected by our vulnerability to a virus, but we're also interconnected and stronger in our response by, by embracing what we can do together to fight it. So um, thank, you, thank you for that. Uh, just wanted to give the, you know, the last word to, to Mayor Holt on both questions. Um, you know, 
skepticism uh, and then, you know, the international aspect, are people aware or thinking about this and do they, do, do they view China as the sort of perpetrator of this or do they think, look, this is just a global pandemic and it happens and we have to deal with it through international diplomacy and cooperation? Yeah. Um, you know, to your first question about, you know, the fact that we acted early and we're able to keep our numbers relatively low compared to other cities, that's where leaders lead and, and where leaders inform. And, you know, I bet every mayor here and certainly all mayors around the country had some sort of regular communication going at the highest points of this crisis. Uh, for me, it was, it was a regular press conference, usually weekly, if not more frequently. And you know, I put a lot of work into the things I said there. And one of the chief uh, pieces of information I continued to share was how hard this was hitting New York, Seattle, Detroit, New Orleans, and other communities around the world um, as an example of what it could be like here and, and trying to help people understand that just because we had um, avoided those uh, outcomes was not because that we'd have a different virus or we're more or we're more hardy here in Oklahoma City. It was just because we were doing the right things at the right time. Um, and, you know, you just got to one phrase I've grown fond of is, is telling people that the umbrella is why you're not wet. And, and so just trying to remind people that um, because we were successful doesn't mean that those things were unnecessary. That's why we were successful. And, uh, and, and I point. haven't had a ton of pushback on that, but it comes up for, believe me. So, uh, you know, I definitely want people to understand that uh, and understand the gravity of the situation. Um, and, and I also remind them that this was a lot worse because there's that audience out there too. You know, well, this is just the flu. Well, it, it surpassed the flu's damage in about a week, you know? So uh, we are definitely, you know, drawing those comparisons is, is important as well. So it's it's really comes down to the rhetorical and communication skills of mayors to kind of paint that picture and, yeah. and shepherd that data in front of the public in a way that they can understand. And second, how about the international piece? Yeah, so, um, you know, Oklahoma City, we're in the middle of the country. We're probably not as internationally focused as we should be. Um, and that's always something I think that leaders need to, need to work on. I've tried to elevate our sister cities program. I have not had um, a lot of people telling me that the virus is, you know, uh, something that should cause us to uh, avoid China as a potential business partner. Um, you know, feelings on China, probably like a lot of things in American life right now, end up falling along partisan lines and what cable news station you watch more. But, uh, uh, you know, I have always been somebody who's inclusive and welcoming, and I certainly. Uh, uh, I call the virus COVID-19, and I have tried to uh, uh, avoid any of those issues and tried to continue to make everybody in our community feel welcome. Actually, I remembered before we got our first case of local spread, my family and I went out to eat uh, at a Chinese restaurant here in town, a locally owned Chinese restaurant, to uh, make a subtle but clear statement uh, in those very early days. This was back on March 12th or something, you know, to illustrate that uh, we were not uh, buying into any kind of... Uh, uh, you know, bigotry that might result. Xenophobia, yeah. Well, uh, Mayor Baird, Mayor Holt, Mayor Kinitra, um, I, I think I'm uh, struck by how your uh, leadership uh, and the, uh, the language that you're using both about uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the responsible approaches that, you, that you're taking and uh, about diffusing some of the, the, the racial tensions uh, that we, we have um, a, a real problem in this country that we have a lot of work to do. It's gonna take a while, but we all have to do our part. But I'd like to thank you. I hope that I can maybe go to the seafood festival uh, in Point Pleasant Beach. I, I'm sure that David and Larian are gonna duke it out for who's got a better steak. <laughs> and I'm sure there's plenty of other great food, uh, but um, I, I thank you for your, uh, your time today. I know, you know you have many demands, and on behalf of Meridian, we'd like to thank everybody listening, and we look forward to seeing you. And please come by when our campus opens up. You have an open door, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. So thank you, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.